You are listening to season four of the Bitcoin Takeover podcast, a 10 part series in which hardware wallet makers and breakers get interviewed. Before I introduce this episode's guests, let's hear a few words from the show's sponsors. LXMI is a European cryptocurrency exchange whose name is inspired by Lakshmi, the Hindu goddess of wealth, good fortune, and prosperity. It's one of the regulated and legal cryptocurrency exchanges. On LXMI, you can buy bitcoins with most fiat currencies, and you can also do trading with top altcoins. They follow the Not Your Keys, Not Your Bitcoins philosophy with their integrated non-custodial wallet, which helps you manage your own private keys. So if you're into trading, then you don't have to worry about having your crypto frozen by whatever political decisions, since you're empowered to hold and move your coins whenever you wish. It's great to have new players like LXMI that respect your financial sovereignty. LXMI is launching in 2020, and for more information, please check out lxmi.io. If you're not into trading, it's recommended to move your coins to a hardware wallet or some other form of cold storage, and in this episode, you're about to find out why. Please keep in mind that this is just an ad for a sponsor of the show. It's not meant to serve as financial advice, and you're responsible to do your own research before buying anything and act according to your own decisions. Embrace your financial sovereignty with agency and precaution. Femex is a Bitcoin exchange with derivative trading options, which focuses on speed, robustness, and maximum uptime. Built by former Morgan Stanley executives, it manages to bring simple and accessible Bitcoin trading. In 2020, Femex will also add S&P 500 stocks, stock indexes, Forex, commodities, and more. Sign up today at femex.com slash bonus and receive a bonus of up to $72. Please keep in mind that this is just an ad for a sponsor of the show. It's not meant to serve as financial advice. and You're responsible to do your own research before buying anything and act according to your own decisions. Embrace your financial sovereignty with agency and precaution. Hi there, and welcome to Season 4, Episode 8 of the Bitcoin Takeover Podcast. I am Vlad, and it's very hard for me to contain my excitement, but my guest today is Slush, who is responsible for creating the world's first mining pool for Bitcoin, which was back in 2010. And also, he's a co-founder of Satoshi Labs, which is responsible for developing the Trezor hardware wallet. And it is because of his efforts in this field that we nowadays have this whole industry of private key security and hardware wallets and all these feuds between companies. And it all started from him and his ideas. So thank you very much for your efforts, sir. And welcome to the Bitcoin Takeover podcast. Yeah. Hello, Vlad. Thank you for introducing me and for inviting me to your podcast. Yeah, it's an honor. So before <laughs> I proceed with the questions that I sent you via email, and that was standard procedure for all of the guests of this season, let me just ask you, how did you first come up with the idea of creating the hardware wallet? Yeah, when when I started... In Bitcoin, with Bitcoin in 2010, I spoke to many people who was also considering getting into the Bitcoin, and I realized that it's harder and harder to explain for them how to do proper setup, like security setup, because most of the people are using like cracked windows or they are not tech savvy at all. 
And I found out that the Bitcoin is not ready for mainstream because it's too technical to do this properly. So I was thinking how to solve this issue and bring some solution, not necessarily the hardware itself, but some solution which could solve this and uh, give these people easy way for managing all all the cycle or the uh, life cycle of the managing private keys, so, so-called bitcoins. Yeah. So uh, we were thinking about about uh, this with with Stick. We we uh, we met already in one Bitcoin uh, Bitcoin uh, meetup here in here in Brand. and uh, we was thinking that uh, we are thinking that uh, some some hardware device like like we, uh, like we know it now but we really didn't want to start hardware hardware setup um, sorry hardware startup because it's just it's just too too hard to do hardware properly so we we were waiting if somebody else will will come with something like this and in 2011 there was uh, I think first conference in uh, in Prague. It was uh, 2011 Bitcoin conference, and there was some guy uh, talking about the the hardware wallet building. I think on Arduino or something like this. And we were like, okay, so when he is going to do this, we are not interested anymore. And uh, actually, one year later, we met again, and I we, we both realized that. His project failed, and then he is not going to make this happen. So we were like, okay, so let's just let's do it, yeah. And we we took some some points like uh, we yeah we decided to use uh, HD like Bit Forty Two um, wallets instead of importing. Uh, importing uh, separate private keys and, and so on, which was the best standard back in these days. And uh, long story short, we are here with with some product which uh, created the whole industry. Yeah, and that's very admirable. And what's interesting about the Trezor in itself is that it uses very common parts that you can outsource by yourself if you find yourself in a country that cannot receive shipments from outside and you just want to create a hardware wallet for yourself, you can just build it from common parts that you find in electronic stores or in various places where you find chips, right? So uh, when, we, when we were thinking about the Trezor design, we were considering all the options like general MCUs, secure elements and so on. But... Um, we were uh, our idea or our mission was to bring some solution which are really in line with the bitcoin philosophy uh, which is built on open source and auditable code base uh, you know no gatekeepers even satoshi pulled uh, himself out of the projects eventually so this is a really strong pieces uh, really strong philosophical mot- motives and we wanted to be as close to these motives as possible. So we ended with, this, with, with the parts which are not uh, uh, which which are not bound with any any uh, any uh, secure element agreements and, and so on. And yes, you can even buy your own parts and. Uh, put your own Trezor together and audit all, your, all the code from our GitHub and then run it on your device and you are completely independent to us. Yeah, that's really admirable. And before I move on and ask you the questions that I sent you, and there's 10 of them, I just want to make a remark that's based on my experience doing this season four of the podcast that has been entirely about hardware wallets and cold storage. And I have spoken to Peter Todd and also Lazy Ninja, who is a guy who hacks hardware wallets. And they both said that if they were were to choose just one hardware wallet to use, then it would be Trezor because it's the most transparent 
it has been around for the longest time and it has been the most tried and tested along all these years. Yeah, that's, that's great to hear. I also know that Peter Todd is not using hardware wallets and it makes uh, complete sense for, for the person like him because he, uh, he knows so much about the security and about his threat model and about the programming and so on that he can secure himself even without uh, like consumer product like, like hardware wallets. I completely get it. And as I uh, told just before, the, the aim is basically to to pack all this knowledge, all this security into the device which can be used by people without all these skills. Still, there is uh, there is a long mission of educating the users how to do this properly, like uh, all the phishing attacks and so on. They are mostly non-technical, non-technical issues. They are like uh, people have to understand how the Bitcoin works. And they still need to know what's the private key and what's the recovery seed and that they shouldn't uh, write down the, uh, the recovery seed into the messenger and send it to, to anybody. There's still so many things to do. But at least there, there are hardware wallets which can make it much easier even for, for message for everybody. Yeah, so this leads me to my next question, which is why should Bitcoiners use a hardware wallet and not resort to something like cold storage on a paper wallet or a steel plate or a brain wallet or something? Yeah, I think... I think paper wallets and uh, and uh, things like cold cards are great thing, but they don't solve the whole life cycle of the of the product or of the private key. Like uh, uh, Satoshi Labs or Trezor helps to to or assisted and gave feedback to the crypto steel how to design how to design the the, the, the steel backup for, for the recovery seat, but still it's just a um, device for persistent the recovery seat. But the life cycle of the recovery seat is much more complex. Um, you At first, you need to create the recovery seat in the safe safe uh, place, in safe, safe manner, in the way that entropy is not broken. That's actually a really hard thing. And there were even issues with uh, some Android phones and uh, with some uh, desktop computers, which had uh, broken hardware, uh, hardware random generator. So even this, this part is really, uh, or maybe, maybe, maybe tricky. And even if you have a paper, a paper wallet or you created your crypto skill with that, at some point of time you will want to spend these these bitcoins and this is also really tricky because you can be safe all the time but once you need to sign transaction or even discover the you take so from from the blockchain which are yours you need to do cryptographic operations and you you are likely not going to to them to do them in your head. So uh, hardware wallet itself solves this life cycle, like complete life cycle of private key. And also uh, the hardware wallet itself is designed in the way that it has as much, uh, as small attack, attack, uh, attack vector as possible. Like the, the code, code base is Open source, so it's auditable. It's actually pretty short. It's it's really possible for single single researcher for single single guy to read through all the source code and verify that it does exactly what, what it what it should, which is actually quite popular. We we have so many contributors and external security researchers doing this and helping us to to uh, make the code stronger and and remove all potential potential doors for, for any, for any uh, attack vectors and so on. So the hardware wallet makes all, all this for the user. All right. So let's say that 
I just got into Bitcoin because I saw the price increase and I think that this is the future of money or something. And I want to buy a hardware wallet to secure the $500 of Bitcoin that I just bought. And why should that device be a Trezor? And what makes it special compared to the competition? Because if you go on Twitter right now, it gets very confusing for newcomers. Yeah. I... I think it's it's pretty easy, but even for me, it took me quite a long time to realize what's the what's the how, how to say this uh, in in easy way. And uh, for me, the main uh, main difference in between Trezor and basically any other hardware wallet is that parts which we are using. And uh, actually. Using secure elements, and I will I will answer this, this later, is so tempting because you can just buy some some chip, which uh, manufacturers say uh, tell you that it's secure. You you put it into your hardware and tell to your custom customers, okay, we use secure elements, so our solution is secure, so you can rely on it with your security. And that's basically what what people want, right? When they are when they are you know, finding out the proper solution. But there's so many so many things in in middle of, of lines, and it's pretty it's it, it's necessary to understand uh, better how all the chip uh, chip industry works. And uh, what I want to say, all the difference is called NDA. NDA means non-disclosure agreement. And this is some sort of contract in between the chip manufacturer and uh, and the company using this chip in in their products. And uh, the main uh, difference is that Trezor doesn't use any uh, any parts which use any NDA, NDA covered chips. You can have full, full, uh, full data sheets. You can buy buy these chips freely, and also it's mo- the most important part. You are not you are not bound with the manufacturer in any way that you can't tell about uh, what you know about the security of the of the green chip. So. Uh, um, when, when I explain this from, from, from another side, if I build if I build a solution with NDA protected chip, I, I close agreement with the, manu- with the manu- manufacturer which um, prohibit me to talking even if I realize that, that there are some practical issues with the chip talking about this publicly to the parties which do not uh, sign these NDAs. And this is this is huge philosophy philosophy issue. Like uh, so far, and we, we use this many times, when some researchers reveal that there's some issue with the with the Trezor, we are uh, we are free to talk about this on our blog, and we we do uh, we did this many times, and um, it's it's all about the incentives of the of of us as a, as, as a manufacturers because we as, as we don't know any venture capital uh, capitals and, and no uh, no all the uh, n- nothing like this behind behind the trezor. Our, our customers are what, what, uh, we, we want to make a product which is absolutely in line with the interests of our of our customers. So we can uh, it's a philosophical question if we can tell them how how they should how, how they should improve their security. But if you uh, if you sign the NDA and you you get to know about something, you are on the on the opposite side. You you must comply with the manufacturer, and this is something which which we 
than want to do. Yeah, that's definitely a plus for the Trezor because everything is transparent and you can even build one yourself. And it's very easy to audit and to tell if there is a security issue. And it's also faster to fix issues if you find them. Yeah, oh, there, there, there's so so many so many details or nuances in this. Like um, for we we started to to work on Trezor with the understanding that the hardware itself, like any any hardware, is broken. Like the industry works in the non-transparent way, and I think that the hardware manufacturer, uh, hardware industry is lagging like 20 or maybe 30 years behind the software industry, with all the open source companies and all the open open standards which we see in the in the in the software industry. This is nothing with what you can uh, what you can follow in the hardware industry itself. It's it's all uh, bind together with the intellectual properties or with the contracts. It, it has, uh, it has, so uh, it, it, it's really non, non transparent itself. And we just refuse to, to bind ourselves into all uh, this all uh, industry, which we don't simply agree with. So we, we actually know, know that. Uh, once you understand that the chip itself is broken, and we never we, we ne never promised any physical uh, physical security of this particular chip because uh, even the manufacturer never never promised this. We built the threat model around the Trezor in the way that if you care about the physical security, it. Uh, you can solve it and do not rely on the promises of the vendor. Like uh, all the other, all the other uh, hardware wallets, basically saying um, we use secure elements, and you can rely at, at some at some level to this to this security promise, but they don't give you any. Advice. They they don't you, they, they don't give you any tool how to actually evaluate this promise. So uh, me as a user, when I am modeling my test model, I really don't know if I can re rely on this secure element for one thousand dollars, one hundred thousand dollars, one million dollar. I I really don't know, and I don't know how to evaluate this. So if I care about the physical security, and I I see that I can't audit the chip, or anybody uh, like when nobody can audit the chip. I have to have some other solution to protect myself from from the possible insecu insecurities or possible backdoors in the chip. And this passphrase, uh, this this answer to all these questions since the beginning, since the since we designed the Trezor, was passphrase. And what, what is changing is our or, or is all the understanding about the chip security. Like 10 years ago, uh, the, uh, there were no specific ways how, how to read out some chips. And there are here now. Yeah, so this change. But the original philosophy is still, is still staying strong. Because with the passphrase, you actually can calculate the attack cost of your device because you can calculate the price of the brute forcing the uh, the the password itself you cannot do this with secure element and it's just about about your trust into all uh, into all this uh, all this supply chain to what level you believe all their their marketing claims and in the extreme, in the in the extreme philosophical, uh, in the extreme philosophical case, you are in Bitcoin, which is uh, which is strongly anti-government, anti-system, cypherpunk concept, uh, which 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 happen to be a to happen to be a reality, and then 
you are buying the device which is certified by a governmental agency that it's secure? That's, that's, that's my concern. So I don't want to trust. I, I want to verify and secure elements or all the chips, not only the secure elements, all the chips are, from my perspective, broken by design. You can't verify this. So let's build the security with this in mind and provide a solution which don't promise what, uh, what you can prove, basically. Yeah, that's definitely an interesting point of view. And this leads me to my next quasi question because it's a series of questions and all the guests from hardware wallet manufacturers have been asked to say something nice and something terrible about their competition. So do you have any preference in regards to the company with which we should start? Well, I usually don't speak about, about the competition unless they speak about me and I have to somehow defend my, my attitudes and my, my stance. So I don't know where to, where to start. Uh, where to start? Okay. Basically, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, I, I, because they were the first ones yeah. that came after Trezor. Yeah. So I think their approach is uh, great for for masses. Like uh, they have uh, perfect product design for for masses. There's everything as it should be when you are uh, buying and, and use a product. From this perspective, it's okay. But, but the I, uh, sorry? The bad stuff about Trezor? <laughs> oh, sorry, uh, Ledger. Uh, about Ledger, yeah. The, the best stuff is that uh, philosophically, I don't think it's aligned with the Bitcoin. And that's, that's, the, that's the point. If this is the point, which everybody has to answer by, by himself. Why I'm here, and if I'm here for trusting somebody else, yeah, you see, you, you, it's my point. As I, as I said, uh, as I said with, the, with the, all these NDA secure elements, I simply, I simply don't get that the ledger is using, don't, don't trust verify, Moto together with using NDA secure element chips uh, protected or or audited by governmental agency. I don't see any any link to this. Okay, what about the Keep Key? Because it's kind of a clone of the Trezor, and it doesn't have a secure element, but at the same time, it's owned by Shapeshift and. I think nowadays it doesn't even have a proprietary software of itself and you connect directly to their platform and your KYC. Anyway, I gave away some details, but can you say something nice and something bad about the KeepKey? Honestly, I don't think that KeepKey is, uh, is a serious player or a legit player in the field anymore as they are uh, seriously lagging uh, on the development, on, on the firmware development for years. So I don't consider this as a serious player anymore. Okay, let's move on. What about the cold card? Yeah, the bit, bitbox and the, and the cold card use basically basically same physical uh, like uh, like uh, some some same design security design, and I think this design is quite quite good, but it's still it's, it's still selling uh, snake oil. Still, when you check the cold card, cold card uh, homepage, they are promising the security. But they, can, they can't prove it. P period. So, uh, cold card with, with the form factor is great toy for, for geeks. I think they, they have uh, many interesting features which are which may be valuable for like advanced users and so on. So I think there's space for this. And the Bitbox is much more mainstream. I think they are uh, they are aiming this way. So so far so far so good. I still have an issue that they are uh, they are promising what they can't prove. 
Okay, that, that's interesting because when I was at Bitcoin Magazine, I wrote an article about cold card open sourcing their design so that you can build your own from parts. So I guess they took some inspiration from Trezor from this point of view and they want to look more transparent. But what is it about a cold, cold card that you cannot verify? Yeah, there's, uh, there's a secure RAM and chip, which is used for physical storage, storage of the seat. And uh, basically, uh, this chip is free for sale, and the short data uh, data sheet is public. But still, for getting the full data sheet, which, which has some some uh, useful information for integrators, you still need to sign NDA. And this is all about the same. Also, um, they are claiming that. It has this, this chip is secure element, and it, it has some specific uh, uh, pa- parameters or uh, yeah, pa- parameters, but they can't audit this. It's still it's still a black box. So basically, even uh, and and this is an important part. I admit that even if the chip is is hacked, then the security is as strong as the trezor. Like if, if you omit omit the if you consider the secure element uh, hack, then the the secret like physical security fall back to the trezor. The difference the, there is a huge difference because we admit that uh, this is a possibility that the the hardware is hacked. So we built the user experience around this. And we had the uh, password support, and uh, we we uh, we speak about this uh, quite uh, quite openly now. That if you have uh, any con- any if you are con- considering physical threat as a, as an issue for you, that you 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 should use the passphrase. On the other side, cold card is not saying this, and they they. Are relying on the on the security of this of this chip, and so this can create false sense of security, which is really which may be turned to be problematic. Okay, so I gotta ask you because I also saw some tweets about this from you, and you think that this part about physical security is just a marketing trap. Yes, because yeah. I remember somebody from Ledger once said that their devices are so safe that you can buy them from eBay and they're going to work. But it doesn't yeah. really work like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, nobody knows. No, nobody really knows if it is safe. This is the point. And uh, yeah, I feel like I am repeating myself, and I, I hope. Uh, that I was I was clear what's my attitude, and uh, in, in recent days I read it. Okay, you should stop talking about secure elements and just just deliver because you are lagging like seven years with the with the product product uh, development behind others which already have secure elements. This is complete misunderstanding of our concept. Like I have Trezor with secure elements on my table. We have uh, R&D in this area, but we, we still don't think any of these solutions is strong enough to really deliver this product and say to, 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 to people, you can trust this. So even if we will deliver uh, some, some solution with uh, secure elements, we will be re- re- talking about uh, about the passphrase, educating, educating about the physical threats in the secure element, and in the end, I think it's it's pointless to to add secure elements at this stage of the chip industry, because because if, if we will add this into the hardware design and don't promote it as a uh, as a solution for physical security, why to even bother to to put it into the Trezor. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, we we really uh, made our homework 
we are in the in the business for many years and we made our homework and the lack of securement in the treasure is not the result of our uh, in inability but our decision right let me just get back to the bit box because i feel like you left them behind a bit and you just put them in the same basket as cold card and when i had Jana schnelli and also Mr. Beckham, they spoke very nicely of Trezor. <clears throat> so I feel like you should at least, even though you're going to be critical, just say something specific about what you think about yeah. the Bitbox. I, I, I think that Bitbox is uh, doing it well. Like I think they are, they are pretty nice players on the, on the market and they were so far really cooperative. So this is what I like, I like on, on the product. Yeah. But you don't like the secure elements, just like the whole card. Yeah, yeah, of course, the story is, is, uh, is still, still the same. Uh, I understand why they put it there. I understand that it's uh, easy marketing to the, just check uh, secure element. Yeah, yeah, yes, we have, you are, you are safe. But <laughs> that's the point of the hardware world, that unless you can audit it, or uh, not necessarily you, but unless anybody can audit it and uh, unless anybody can calculate the attack into the stuff, I don't think the secure element is, is for the effort. Okay, let's move on and talk about something that people usually point out when they talk about hardware wallets, and this is trade-offs. And do you think that yeah. the Trezor in its design has any kind of trade-offs? Of course, of course, I would like to have impenetrable, impenetrable hardware because it will give you much better user experience. And user experience is something we take really, really seriously. And of course, the passphrase pass itself is, is making the, the experience much worse. But uh, yeah, we know, the, we know the reality. So I think we will need to live with passphrase for, for many years, unless something magically changed in the, in the hardware industry. And this is, this is the downside of our, of our design. Yeah. What about Shamir backup? I remember that was a very big improvement when it first yeah. came out and it was a massive discussion that was started in the community. And I yeah. think up to this point, Trezor is still the only company that has that implemented. Yeah, this is a really good point. I think that the current situation of hardware wallets is, is, uh, is packed on the discussion about the security element itself. If a full secure element certified by foreign government agency is the, the best solution, or if the physical storage is the best solution, or if the general MCU is the, the best solution. Generally, I think this is really minor. The, 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 this, this really has a small place in the overall threat model. And I understand this is a topic because it's uh, quite easy to communicate to users that some, uh, some hardware wallet has something better than the others. So it's, it's uh, easy to talk about this. But I think that overall threat model is much more complicated. And what, what's not so big, uh, what's not this discussed enough, in my opinion, is the life cycle of the recovery seed itself. Like, uh, why do you talk all the time about the secure elements when the hardware wallet uh, print out or generate for you the recovery seed? Which you have, uh, which you have in, in your in your pocket, and it's not covered by secure element. It's even not covered by the passphrase. It's just plain old uh, piece of the paper which holds all your all your millions in Bitcoin. So, I think the security of recovery C is is uh, second part of the story with hardware wallets because hardware wallets or Trezor solves the biggest issue of these these days. 
like moving the private keys from online environment to the secondary hardware with limited attack vector, with auditable code, with uh, with uh, all these research on the on the on the hardware possible and so on. But uh, it's not the end of the story. You still have to put private keys somewhere because because the hardware itself, like the standard uh, consumer electronics, is is really unreliable. And you can't count on on uh, on the fact that it will survive like ten or twenty years. It's clearly possible that in ten years, if you turn on, uh, turn on your hardware wallet, it will be just just blank, just just it it won't boot up. So we we moved the private keys from the online world. From to the limited, really limited hardware, and we are we are discussing all the security issues with the chips and so on. But the next part of the story is to solve the what to do with the recovery card itself because it's that's the most valuable part in, in the whole story. And our answer to this to this uh, complex topic is the Shamir Vega. Because until until now, or until we released the Shamir Becker, users were really creative about what what they do with the recovery seats. Somebody just don't care, which is probably not great, but somebody even and and that's that's the force when the user thinks that he is power user and and he's going to create some custom security setup, uh, which I never re- recommend. They like shuffle the words in the in the order they they want to remember, and when they for, uh, when they forgot the the pattern how they shuffled the words, they are skewed. And or they are they were trying to split the recovery seat into two or three parts, hiding the parts on on different places. But they usually don't understand uh, that it's it may be possible to calculate like the last uh, last few words even without having it and so on. So we introduced the Shamer backup to improve the situation and give another tool to the to the users how to manage this recovery scene and basically it allow a cryptographic sound way to split the recovery seed into into um, more chunks more, more shares uh, in the in the way you can customize how many shares uh, you need to recover and how many shares is, is in total so there's uh, it, it's allow failover, and it also allow geographic backups. Like you can you can uh, split your seat and have uh, all the share in another another city or even country, and uh, even if somebody steal a small portion, a small portion then 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 is the defined threshold. They can't learn anything from this share, which can help them brute force the rest of the uh, rest of the shares. So I think th- this is really, really important, and I expect that other other wallets will somehow implement this or or some similar uh, schemes in the future. I know that there are some some vendors wor- working on support uh, slip 39 into their solutions, and I think it it makes complete sense. And for that reason, we make it again fully open source because we really want to encourage the the industry to adopt the standard because we believe it it's in, another important step in the development and the, in the evolution of the of the end user security. Yeah, and for the people who are not aware, SLIP doesn't stand for Stefan Livera Podcast. It's actually Satoshi Labs Improvement Proposal. <laughs> Thank you for the question, yeah. Yeah, I feel like sometimes you get lost in explanations and maybe that the average user will not be aware that there is a huge development 
laboratory that you have with Satoshi Labs, and you're trying to constantly find new ways to improve security for hardware wallets. Yeah, we are spending quite quite a lot of time uh, researching all these standards. Like we we uh, back, uh, back in days we created PIP thirty nine, which is now used by absolute majority of the, of the wallets. It's like a widely used standard. You know, also standards for derivation paths for Bitcoin and uh, other altcoin uh, private keys and so on. So this is uh, where we really want to move, move the industry forward. And actually, we are we are living from selling the hardware. But we see the hardware itself just just as a piece of the much bigger picture, and we are spending a lot lot time a lot of time on improving or thinking through all this all this cycle how to improve all the industry, and uh, we just don't want to insist on fighting over the details in the hardware itself. Yeah, because you have said it from the beginning when you first started with the Trezor you're actually thinking in terms of software and you're reluctant into getting into hardware because it's yes. complicated. Yes. Uh, that's, uh, that was actually our... our, our in, in, this bigger, in this big picture, it's, it makes sense to make uh, as limited hardware, as, uh, cheap, as cheap hardware or as uh, hardware with, with no, no some special... Yeah, some special insight because uh, it will make it will make work. Uh, it, it will do the work. Basically, Trezor is a, is a reference diagram of the microchip with uh, uh, or MCU with two buttons and a display. There's no no magic in it. All the magic is the software and the security design in this software, which cover all the attack vectors, including the physical attack vectors. There is no magic soup in the Trezor. Yeah. Yeah, and some people, they will look at the Trezor and they will say, okay, so if it has this cheap microcontroller unit and it just has buttons and the screen, then why does it cost, like how much is it, 120 euro or something for the Model T? And yeah. The, yeah. the answer is that they pay for customer support and development and research and all that stuff, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, the, the model one costs, I think, 40, $49. So it's not $100 anymore. But yeah, people underestimate the effort and R&D which, which we put into the software part. I, I always say that Satoshi Labs is a software company. We, we, uh, the hardware for us is just, it's just a tool. It just need to, to do the, do the thing, but all the magic is in software, which is fully audited. Yeah. And also the software is fully open source. So yes. other companies just take your research software and create new products for cheaper prices. Yeah. Uh, actually, this was, this was a topic few years ago when uh, keep key started when all the chinese clones started uh, that's in interesting i didn't know my colleague told me like uh, two days ago that uh, they made uh, research and there's around 40 clones of trezor like uh, some iranian national uh, vendor doing hardware wallet based on the on the trezor uh, trezor scheme and so on i even didn't know this so, yeah, this is, I suppose this is power of the open source and all the standards and all the code and, and all the electronics, which is open source. And uh, we were, back, back in years, we were worrying about this a bit. If we can do sustainable business on fully open source, everything. And I think that the conclusion is that yes, because in the security industry, you probably don't want to save ten bucks uh, on the on the knockoff hardware, like clone of, of the hardware, when you are going to put like thousands and more dollars into the Bitcoin to, to the device. So we were a bit afraid of this, but it turned out that the people 
uh, care about this. They, they they listen about the possible issues, security issues, which comes with the buying cheap clothes. And in the end, I think this was a winning strategy. Like, uh, I really believe in open source. I, in the contrary of what, uh, what uh, BT Chip uh, from the ledger told, told you that uh, he didn't think that open source solve all the issues. I think the opposite. Uh, let me let me explain. Uh, we have so many so many uh, people watching our hands and doing the security uh, security research and even breaking the trezor. And they are all the white hackers, uh, white hackers. Which are then reporting the reporting the issues uh, to the to the product, and if you check if you check our security bay, there's uh, actually a lot, lot of lot, lot of reports which we responded with, with the with the with some fixes in the software, and I believe that this is this is the result of the open source because without without this with with any with any uh, obstacles in this, these wider hackers won't do this. And I was, and, and actually, the activity of the researchers is uh, is the indicator of the living community around, around the product. And we were asking f- few of them why they spend so many time, uh, so many time on the Trezor, and actually not on the competition. And uh, Answer was quite interesting for us because to really evaluate the chip or hold the hold the solution, which includes the NDA chip, they would need to sign the NDA with the manufacturer, which means that if they will find out something, they wouldn't be able to tell it publicly which won't give them the social credit, which is usually why they are into the the research in the first place. So this is, um, for me, this was uh, uh, like uh, uh, eye-opening moment when I realized that, okay, this is interesting. There is uh, most likely the Trezor is most effective hardware what on the market just because we are basically transparent and it attracts the researchers to do the job. Yeah, and also Lazy Ninja, who is the only hacker that I was able to get on the show, also said that he did spend some time on the Trezor, but it takes a lot of time to find some kind of vulnerability because there are too many people doing this and there are lots of eyes on the software and on the device itself. And that's why possibly yeah. it's the most secure of all hardware wallets. Yeah. So so this, in my opinion, this proves that open source actually works because if it attracts wider hackers, which are then enforcing, uh, the, they reinforcing the, the product, it makes the whole industry much stronger and much better. Now, there is one marketing point from which Sometimes cold card attacks you, for example, because you support lots of altcoins yeah. and you add them to the software implementation. And you also have a Trezor Model T that is Bitcoin only. And I have to ask, is there demand for yeah. that or is it sold just as well as the... About, about the BTC only firmware? Uh, to my knowledge, uh, it's uh, all, it's uh, supported also for Trezor One and uh, Trezor Model T. Um, yeah, we are Bitcoiners in in heart, so this was a natural thing to to do when there was a request from our our users, and I completely get this. But if you are asking me about uh, the sales numbers, I don't think it it was uh, it's measurable or it made any impact. I believe this is important for a really small portion of the user base, and but it, it's not like a mainstream, uh, mainstream requested feature. Yeah, sometimes, you know, people can be mean on Twitter and that's why I raised this yeah. specifically. 
So I saw a presentation last year with Stick, who is the co-founder of Sasoshi Labs, and I think he was in Malta at Tone Basis yes. Conference. And he showed how you can set up a multi-sig with a Trezor and the Electrum software. And it was so fast and so simple. But at the same time, there are people who criticize the security model and say that the average user should not do that. And multi-sig is only for people who require it and not just something that paranoid individuals who don't hold too many Bitcoins should pursue. So what is your stance on multi-sig? Yeah. My stance on, on multi-sig is that this, it's a great tool for um, multi-user funds. Like if you have a company and you need to hold some Bitcoins, then it's great for have cosigners, which are different, different parties, different people. And it's perfectly fit for, for this purpose. But I think that uh, many people who are using multisig in the way that they, they are the only cosigner and they have only multiple devices handling them and so on. I think it's a bit overkill. And all, all this is about usability and, uh, and the increasing complexity of the setup. Because I think it's so easy. To, to shoot yourself in, in the foot with the, with the multi It's, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I really don't think there's, uh, there's, it, it's, it's necessary for, for the single user to use multi Because, uh, I, I saw this from, from the perspective. If you are, uh, if you are a user and you want to use, uh, you want to use, uh, this account like daily, then you cannot uh, have proper go backup uh, distribution of these of these units. Plus, of course, you still need to care about the backup because I wouldn't rely with my bitcoins, uh, which are which which have private keys stored on electronic device devices because I understand how bad actually these devices are in remembering any data like flash flash memory can fail at any time. So it's much more complex and still it increases uh, increase or downgrades the user experience. Because if you use this daily, you need to use multiple devices and do this ceremony all the time when you are going to, to send, send Bitcoins. And on the other side, if you are holder, like long-term holder, you don't need this multi site either. Because in this case, you, pro- you probably don't want to even have the C loaded in the hardware wallet. What, what I would recommend for a long-term uh, order is to do the setup, do the multi-sig or even, uh, sorry, not multi-sig, do the Shamir, Shamir setup or even super Shamir setup, which is even more complicated. Like you, you can have Shamir out of the Shamir shares itself. So you can have really crazy, crazy stubs here, which are, which are really for many, uh, for advanced users only. But th- th- this is the point. Let's, let's go back, back to the story. If you want to, uh, to hold uh, bitcoins, then just generate the Shamir backup. Store the seeds properly with the crypto steel, uh, dig in on the, on the, safe place or give it as a social backup for people you, you really trust, which eventually, uh, to people which eventually didn't know, even know each, each to other or something like this. And then you can wipe the hardware wallet, which will be completely empty. And you don't need to, to care about all the firmware updates and all the hacks, all, all these things which we were talking all, all the time in, in this podcast anymore. Because you have the metal backup, which can survive centuries. And you are not, uh, not um, uh, your, uh, the software security is not in your threat model anymore. So this is all about not making the setup complex, but actually about the limiting the, the attack surface to the to the state that you not only uh, that you don't have multi-six setup, but you don't even need a hardware rod at all. 
And I think this is much, much better solution. Okay. So at the end of the day, who should use a multi-sig? Like should somebody who owns like $500 of Bitcoin set up a multi-sig or is it for companies that have multiple parts? Yeah. My, I think it's it's mostly it's mostly for companies for for uh, for use cases where multi, where more more users need to co-sign the specific transactions, and I don't see such big uh, such big use case for in for single individuals. Of course, there are so many products uh, like uh, I don't want to name, but yeah, uh, like co-signing. They will co-sign. Uh, or or keep some of your shares for you and automatically co-sign or they will authorize you and so on. But it actually makes the makes the threat model much more complicated and much more foggy than uh, doing this on your own. Because when you create your wallet, with some other party, even if it's uh, if it's uh, established player in the field, still they have to know about your wallet something. Maybe they they need to know extra, so they know you most likely, and they know how much money do you have, which may or may be not a problem of your test model. Depends on how rich you are and how how. Paranoid are you? But I just want, want to say that every time you add the multisig into your setup, it uh, it uh, solves some kind of some kind of issues. But in my opinion, it adds much bigger complexity uh, than uh, than a normal user can really evaluate and uh, evaluate the risk. Now, here's an interesting question that usually pops out, especially when it comes to newbies who get into the space. Because nowadays, it seems like hardware wallets and nodes in a box and all these products are kind of part of the lifestyle of a Bitcoiner. And if you want to be a true community member, you have to get one of these. And sometimes you, you see these small groups of people I think one is established with Casa and one is established with Cold Card and you see them on Twitter all the time. And when is the point yes. when you should be considering buying a hardware wallet? Let's say that you have your coins on Coinbase and you're thinking about getting a Trezor. But is there like a specific amount or a specific moment when you learn more about Bitcoin when you should get a hardware wallet? Yeah, I I understand that most of the people get into the Bitcoin in the way that they buy something on the exchange and it lies there for some time. And many of people and ends there, like the journey ends here for them because they they have a Bitcoin and they speculate on this or whatever. But I think it, it takes it, it requires some personality some kind of personality to really want to dig more into into what the Bitcoin is. And at this point, I think when, when the curiosity starts to, to appear, then then the hardware wallets and, and Trezor is, is is here for them. Because once uh, it's it's really convenient and like mainstream to just buy buy Bitcoin on the exchange and leave it there. But, you know, uh, not your keys, not your Bitcoins. And so I don't consider these people like Bitcoiners, really. They just have uh, another bank account, which is denominated in Bitcoin. And as I said, I'm quite a cypherpunk. Uh, yeah, uh, you, you know, I, I like cypherpunk philosophy and I built all everything around this. And um, I think that, uh, that the Bitcoin is changing uh, through the through the ten years since I'm since I'm in the project, and I think it's uh, becoming more obvious that the privacy is an issue. I honestly don't think that this was 
always like this. Like, of course, there, there were uh, all the time people paranoid about their privacy, but I didn't think it was like uh, mainstream, ma mainstream in the terms of the Bitcoin a few years ago, the mainstream concern. Because, because the Bitcoin was so small, even for, for, yeah, for governments, for, for, for everybody, so people didn't feel threat. From, from this from this side. But now governments and states are recognizing Bitcoin more and more and it's getting more probable that, the, uh, that uh, there will be some actions like uh, now all, all the government stuff, uh, IRS and all the American agencies and so on are going after the Bitcoiners to tax everything properly and so on. And uh, I think it makes much more sense to think about the privacy. And I think the, uh, the mainstream, the Bitcoin mainstream is going to realize this more than before. So for, for this, I think it's also bigger challenge for the Trezor because so far we have been solving more or less the security part. The security and privacy are two completely different things. Like you can be secure, like you, you can have the private, private keys, but your XPUBs may be completely public and you are still secure from, from some perspective. Of course, you, you are not secure from the, from the social, social attack vector and so on, but uh, let's, let's consider the technical security. And uh, to be honest, years ago, we are fo focused mainly on bringing the security to, to the mainstream user, to the Bitcoin mainstream user. So we built the, the wallet as a web application because it was the, the easiest way of onboarding the users because they are used to use uh, web browsers and so on. But as the industry is changing, and we see this, we are developing like, like for one year, it's uh, intensive intensive work, uh, it lasts one year. We are working completely new solution for the uh, for the application, like front end for, for, for the Trezor, which will sit on the user computer or mo mobile phone and eventually use local or remote but user's own uh, Bitcoin node. So I think this is the next next part of, of the of the mission of self sovereignty of the user. That uh, so far the users were not uh, were were not um, uh, kept by by uh, by Trezor um, from the security perspective. Like everything was open source and it was auditable, but. And still, the user was was open to use Electrum or now Wasabi and so on, but uh, still, it was not the mainstream or or main uh, main um, application like main user experience for, from the Trezor. And now we are working on the solution that this will come with uh, like out of the box with the Trezor. So we want to give. Um, first, first an experience with self sovereignty for every user for one click. Yeah, speaking of this, when I wrote that long pre part review of hardware wallets in November for Bitcoin Magazine, I was not able to find a software application that is installed locally and is not that browser extension that is usually the most popular way of interacting with your Trezor device. And I was unaware of the software that you released in 2016. I don't know why I didn't find it. But I also know that right now you are working on another piece of software that gets installed on your computer and is supposed to provide more financial privacy. Yeah. Uh, I think you are talking about the blog book, about the, the indexer, uh, which, which we maybe started in 2016, I'm, I'm not sure. Or which, which part of, of the software you are pointing to? So the client that you're using to interact with your Trezor. And it was something that yeah. you would install on your computer and you would generate the addresses yeah. and keep your transaction history yeah. on your hard drive, just like a full node. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the fact is that uh, we have our backends fully open source, even backends for other coins and Bitcoin. All the, all the altcoins which, which Trezor supports are fully open source and you can uh, download them and install on your computer. So you can even now be completely independent to Satoshi Labs, which to be honest is quite a different story than with, for example, Ledger. We has these backend sponsors. So if you have some some coin there which doesn't have uh, alternative client, which which has support for the hardware wallet, you can be easily locked out of the money once uh, once the ledger shut down their their backend. But Trezor has all this completely open source. But on the on the, on the other hand, I have to admit that it's not for normal users. Like you need some Linux skills to start this and uh, and sync it with the network and so on. So our focus is to do this in a way which is suitable for every Tesla user to actually install on the computer and uh, with with uh, with the backend of of his choice to uh, to be completely independent on anybody else. So what do you think about people who run their Trezor through Electrum or through Wasabi or some other third-party wallet? I'm completely fine with this as, a, as a no solution fits all. And I think, uh, actually, I'm, I'm a big, uh, big fan of both of uh, Electrum and Wasabi because Electrum was a huge inspiration for, for us when we started with, with Trezor. We learned so many things how the how wallets work inside so i i i love both both products and uh, so i have no no problem what, with uh, with people using Trezor with other clients but on the other hand i think the user experience is not so great like uh, of course normal uh, linux user or power user can do this but it's not the user experience which we would like to see when you when you invest one one hundred dollars for for your security setup. Now I'm going to have to ask you about privacy and the growing market for user data, because the companies mm-hmm. like Chainalysis getting bigger and even though they laid off some some employees, they get contracts with governments and the IRS and United States. Yeah. And when you use a Trezor by default with the browser plugin that you have to install, does Trezor collect any kind of data regarding to your IP address, email address, stuff like that, metadata about your transactions? Can Trezor see how many Bitcoins are owned by the users and stuff like that? Yeah. The important thing on the Trezor design is that we can't distinguish uh, devices each, each to other when, uh, when we are shipping them. Like there's no technical way how we can join the order with the specific device when you connect it to the computer. So at no, uh, at no uh, specific time, we knew your identity, like real identity, even if you buy uh, the device from us. The other thing, and I think I already explained uh, part of this, is that you are, uh, or typical user is connecting the device uh, to our uh, web application, which is using our, our backends, which are open source, but still they are run by us. So technically, we may know uh, your your uh, balances of the users and each of, of the users and so on, but on the other side we don't do this. Like it's our our social contract. I think that we we have this even on our side somewhere, but we we don't this uh, we don't do this. And the the such architecture that uh, is not here for our for us wanting your metadata. That it's for the people to have the easy onboarding experience. But we are, as I said already, we are actively working on the solution where you don't want need to connect 
the treasure to our servers at any point of time. So this is this is the proof that we we are quite serious in this, and uh, we don't want to be the gatekeepers, and we don't want to know anything about about you. That's fair because when I look at the keep key right now, it costs about twenty dollars, and it was two hundred dollars like three years ago or something, and their business model is to sell in large numbers, but you also have to KYC with them. So you sign up with your data when you order and they probably find a way to sell that data. I'm just assuming here. I don't know if they do that, but there is probably a market for that kind of data that they're collecting. And it's reassuring to know that Trezor cannot associate the order number or the device production number with the user. So, sorry, can you repeat the question? Sorry. Yeah, it was more of a remark because it's reassuring to know that Trezor doesn't doesn't know who bought what device. So you cannot yeah. associate yeah. a ser serial number for one device with the user who ordered it. Exactly, because and this is the auditable part. Like you can check the software that it's not uh, not revealing any serial number or anything over the protocol, so we can't link the specific uh, device with your order. Actually, there is there is generated some some ID which is which is in the protocol because because uh, the application need to identify the, the unit when the when you connect it to. To uh, you know, for technical details, but this ID is generated again every time you generate the generate the wallet. It's a random uh, it's a random string, so it's generated once you uh, once you connect it the first time into the, into your computer. So we cannot know this prior uh, the shipment. So this is the this is the part we can prove because it's it's baked in the open source software. The another part which we can't prove uh, yet is that we don't collect any financial data from our backends. It's just our promise. I'm quite open about this, but we are working on this thing to solve so we can uh, uh, be able to tell that you can verify it yourself. All right. So, Mr. Slash, we have been speaking for nearly two hours. And I, I'm just going to ask you one last question, and that's it. And it's also very general. So, what is Trezor planning for the hardware wallet market in the future? And what should we expect in the coming months or years? Yeah. Um, it's quite a wide uh, question. And I will try to summarize. I think that I already said, said this uh, during the interview. And the remaining remaining topic is the usability of the products and the usability of, of the whole concept. So there, it will be uh, more available for the for a bigger part of the Bitcoiners, because that's our mission to secure as much as much people as possible. So the usability part is still uh, is a remaining issue, which we are, we don't think it's solved yet. And another big topic which we are working on is the privacy and the uh, sovereignty, which which comes out of the box. So no uh, no crazy set setups with uh, with some Linux boxes and so on. Uh, because we, we think this can be, this can go, uh, this can go out of the box with the Trezor itself. And the remaining part, the, the, the last part, is that we didn't hang up uh, with the hardware security. We, uh, as we spent the first half uh, of the interview talking about, about the, the hardware, I think that currently there is no better solution which can be provable better than, than Trezor on the market from the cheap perspective. And uh, uh, still we are not, not, not satisfied with, with, the, with, the, with the current situation. And we are working on some specific uh, projects which could make this better because we think that Bitcoin deserves more transparency on all layers 
of the of the software and hardware stack. And I think I will be talking about this on Bitcoin 2020 in March. So if you are in, interested in this part, you should you should follow follow my my speech. Yes, and even if you're not able to come to San Francisco, and I will not be able to come to San Francisco because it's very expensive, you can still watch that on live stream, I think. And Bitcoin Mac. Yeah, it, 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 will, it will be definitely it will be definitely uh, on YouTube eventually. So no need to go to San Francisco. I think uh, it will be available, like public available. Yeah. So thank you very much, Mr. Slush. I don't have any more questions yeah. for you at this time. <laughs> thank you a lot for 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 the um, for 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 the space in your. Yeah, in your podcast and thank you for your question. Yeah, you can have a discussion about hardware wallets without including Trezor. <laughs> Sorry? No, you, I didn't, you get didn't get that. So you cannot have a discussion in the hardware oh. without Trezor. <laughs> of course, of course, you, you can't. And, uh, we, we are here to stay for some time still. <laughs> yeah, so have a nice rest of your day. Yeah, bye. Let's hear a few words from the show's sponsors. LXMI is a European cryptocurrency exchange whose name is inspired by Lakshmi, the Hindu goddess of wealth, good fortune, and prosperity. It's one of the regulated and legal cryptocurrency exchanges. On LXMI, you can buy bitcoins with most fiat currencies and you can also do trading with top altcoins. They follow the Not Your Keys, Not Your Bitcoins philosophy with their integrated non-custodial wallet, which helps you manage your own private keys. So if you're into trading, then you don't have to worry about having your crypto frozen by whatever political decisions, since you're empowered to hold and move your coins whenever you wish. It's great to have new players like LXMI that respect your financial sovereignty. LXMI is launching in 2020. And for more information, please check out lxmi.io. If you're not into trading, it's recommended to move your coins to a hardware wallet or some other form of cold storage. And in this episode, you're about to find out why. Please keep in mind that this is just an ad for a sponsor of the show. It's not meant to serve as financial advice. and You're responsible to do your own research before buying anything and act according to your own decisions. Embrace your financial sovereignty with agency and precaution. Femex is a Bitcoin exchange with derivative trading options, which focuses on speed, robustness, and maximum uptime. Built by former Morgan Stanley executives, it manages to bring simple and accessible Bitcoin trading. In 2020, Femex will also add S&P 500 stocks, stock indexes, Forex, commodities, and more. Sign up today at femex.com slash bonus and receive a bonus of up to $72. Please keep in mind that this is just an ad for a sponsor of this show. It's not meant to serve as financial advice. and You're responsible to do your own research before buying anything and act according to your own decisions. Embrace your financial sovereignty with agency and precaution. <laughs>